Klaus Jürgen Raider's Carcassonne landed at the turn of the century and immediately found massive success. Two decades on, there are now at least 16 different standalone versions of the game. Some simple, some complex, some cutthroat, some cooperative, plus many repackaged versions, big boxes, travel versions and winter editions. And that's not to mention the additional material, 10 mainline boxed expansions, and too many promos and mini expansions to count. In this video, I'll be taking a look at many of the variant rule sets and discussing which version might be best for a player who enjoys thematic games, which version you might like if you want meaningful choices, which version is great for interaction, and plenty more. Sadly, many of the older expansions and variants are currently out of print, but they all come up frequently on the second-hand market, with some inevitably attracting a higher price than others. I'll be discussing the game design lessons that I've learned from immersing myself in the vast catalogue of Carcassonne titles. Today, Carcassonne joins King Domino, Everdell, Sushi Go and Viticulture in my Game Design Hall of Fame. I'm Adam Porter, I'm a game designer and reviewer, and on this channel I explore games with a focus on product design. If you like what I do, please share these videos, comment below, and subscribe to the channel. Carcassonne was inspired by Vader's visit to the medieval walled city in France. He set about representing that region in a tabletop game, with players collectively building a bird's eye view of the landscape through competitive tile laying. Considering the relatively abstract nature of the gameplay, it's perhaps surprising that this was a game designed with a theme-first approach, rather than pasting a setting onto existing mechanisms. I was introduced to Carcassonne on my first ever visit to Cardiff's game store Rules of Play in 2011. I was immediately intrigued by the concept. I was looking for a board game, but this was more like a jigsaw, a map that you built with the other players, creating this glorious medieval vista. But even better, this jigsaw has a winner. Before we dive deep into the world of Carcassonne, I've got a message for any game designers watching this video. This video is sponsored by Launch Tabletop. I'm putting together a new prototype with the intention of pitching it later this year. Launch Tabletop is a board game manufacturer with a print-on-demand service called Launch Lab. I got great results with my first prototype board game, and I recently laid out the files for a simple card game, which I'm eagerly awaiting to receive in the post. Producing prototypes this way is addictive. Today I'm exploring the options for printing a flip and write game. Now I've generated my placeholder art using AI and the Launch Lab templates make it really simple to lay out the graphics for the various game components. I'm going to place an order for a pad of scoring sheets, a deck of cards, a few pencils and a lavishly illustrated box, and I'll show you the results when they arrive in the next couple of weeks. Launch Lab has a very simple user interface which guides you through the process, and your game will be posted to you wherever in the world you're located with an incredibly fast turnaround time. The quality of a Launch Lab prototype is indistinguishable from professionally published games. If you'd like to create a single copy of your game, or anything up to a thousand copies, then visit launchtabletop.com and start prototyping. Use the coupon code ADAMINWALES for a 20% discount. Carcassonne is a relatively simple tile laying game for two to five players lasting around 30 to 40 minutes. Players collectively build a landscape of walled cities, roads, monasteries and farms by placing tiles into a shared grid. On your turn, you place a single tile drawn randomly from the deck. It must match the features of the other tiles surrounding it. Additionally, on your turn, you can place a player token onto one of these features on the tile. A road, a city, a monastery or a field. These player tokens are called meeples. You'll be hearing that word a lot. When a feature is completed, your meeple is returned to you and you gain points, marking them on the scoring track. Completing a road scores you one point per tile. Completing a city is worth two points per tile, plus two points per coat of arms in the city. You complete a monastery by completely surrounding it with tiles, scoring nine points. And farmers are scored at the end of the game, gaining three points for each completed city adjacent to the farm. You can never add a meeple to a feature which already has a meeple on it, 
but through clever tile placement, you can join up pre-existing features, bringing meeples together within a city, a road or a field. And in these instances, the player with the most meeples on the feature scores the points. If tied, all players score. When all tiles have been placed, the highest scorer wins. Carcassonne was an immediate hit for Raider and German publisher Hans im Gluck, who had previously found success with modern classics Die Marke, Modern Art and Tigris and Euphrates. Hans im Gluck were looking to repeat El Grande's 1996 Spiel des Jahres win, and Carcassonne fulfilled that wish in the year 2001. In the years following receipt of that prestigious award, Hans im Gluck used the same approach for Carcassonne that they had done previously with El Grande, producing a continuous stream of expansions, repackaged editions of the game and sequels. While El Grande peaked and plateaued, the stream of new Carcassonne releases continues two decades later. There's a lot to explore, a great many lessons for game makers, some bold innovations, some clumsy missteps, but surely there's something here for every taste. So why did Carcassonne become such a juggernaut back in the year 2000? Well, Carcassonne was released just as dial-up internet was becoming widely used in people's homes. Another pivotal product was released in 2000, a website called Board Game Geek, where players could discuss their favorite tabletop games. Klaus Teuber's Settlers of Catan was flying the flag globally for German hobby games, and Carcassonne landed at just the right time, with a huge international audience primed and ready to dip their toes into the water of strategic board games. There was a limited range of titles available, especially outside of Germany, which meant there was a massive opportunity for another breakthrough success to rival Catan. The original box cover might not fly in 2023, and indeed it's been reworked several times over recent years, but it had a gentle quality, which served it well through the early years. Doris Matthaus's cover positioned Carcassonne as a product which could be enjoyed by anyone. The picture book aesthetic wouldn't look out of place sitting alongside a pile of jigsaws in an independent bookstore, attracting consumers who were tired of shallow TV tie-ins and plastic monstrosities. The standard approach, utilised by German publishers at the time, was to utilise hand-drawn historical illustrations to highlight the adult appeal of a game, and to distinguish strategic board games from children's toys. Carcassonne was a particularly effective example. Our avatar is clear. We're seeing the walled city through the eyes of a softly smiling knight. He seems distracted by the presence of an attractive woman who seems to be looking us, the players, straight in the eye. In earlier editions, the woman was absent. In her place, a suspicious-looking man lingering with hand on sword hilt. And this is a low-quality image, so it's hard to say for sure, but I think the knight's expression was originally more of a grimace. Intriguingly, that suspicious man isn't forever lost. He's hiding among the bushes in the background of the later edition. Now I've gone off on a tangent, forgive me. What I wanted to say was that Carcassonne is perfectly balanced, presenting itself as a game for families while also looking grown up enough for adults. Times have changed, of course, and modern editions need to compete with thousands of popular titles with incredible artwork. A new cover in 2014 used the same basic formula. Two figures look over the medieval city walls. The attractive woman once again looks us in the eye, inviting us into their tiny meeple world. In this cover, we're taking a view from above the city, as we do in the game, and doves circle to get a literal bird's eye view of the city. The composition of this cover was very accomplished, but by 2014 it had become much harder to stand out in a marketplace filled with similar looking boxes. The cover was once again changed in 2021, with the introduction of a much more literal and very beautiful image of a medieval landscape being built one tile at a time. The outward presentation of a game should tell us what we're going to be doing, but also how we're going to feel when we play. And Carcassonne has this nailed, from its early storybook aesthetic to the more literal art of recent editions. And we shouldn't forget the wealth of gorgeous artwork adorning the boxes of many standalone editions and expansions. Similar concepts apply from the picture book quality of the early editions of Hunters and Gatherers and Overhill and Dale to the more modern aesthetic of Gold Rush and South Seas. 
there's usually someone looking us in the eye, inviting us to join the fun. Whether that's a gold miner, a sheep, a ghost, or a caveman. In Hunters and Gatherers, roads have become rivers, cities are now forests, and farms are now meadows. A river is complete when there's a lake with fish on each end. And the owner scores one point per tile in that river, plus one point per fish in the lakes. Each player has two huts. These can be placed on a river or a lake. And each hut scores points at the end of the game for each fish in the entire river system. Meeples in meadows at the end of the game score two points for each deer, mammoth and cattle. But each saber-toothed tiger in a meadow cancels out one deer. Onboarding is about more than just outward presentation. It's also about the ease with which a player can start using a product. And Carcassonne has a huge leg up here. There's an enormous amount of content online about the game. Two decades of user reviews, YouTube videos, strategy guides, and instructional aids. Every assistant in every local game store is likely to know how to play Carcassonne. And we'll be able to give you a demo at the drop of a hat. And the rules really are simple. Many have complained about the unintuitive scoring of farmers. So much so that in some recent editions, they're described as an advanced variant rather than a core aspect of the game. But essentially, Carcassonne is an easy game to teach and the rule books have served it well. From my early edition to the well-presented rule book in the most recent big box collection. There were some tweaks to scoring in the earliest versions of the game, but the final system is pretty robust. It baffles me, however, that after two decades of producing Carcassonne products, the publisher still struggles to make the rules clear in the various standalone editions. In virtually all of the recent standalone games, Mists Over Carcassonne, the Around the World series, Carcassonne Star Wars, the rules are confusingly laid out and clumsily written. Perhaps it's a translation issue, but you'd think they'd have this down by now. Most confusingly of all, there is no consistent naming convention for the various features and tokens. In the original edition, this was a follower. Now the game understandably uses the generic term meeple. Followers could be knights in cities, thieves on roads, farmers on fields, or monks on cloisters. In 2023, thieves are travelers, and cloisters and monasteries. With me so far? In Overhill and Dale, farms are now called meadows and cities are now farms. Confusing, but we'll let it slide. In Gold Rush, cities are mountains and monasteries, aka cloisters, are now cities. Uh, what? <laughs> In New World, farms are called plains, cities are towns, and monasteries, aka cloisters, are now called farms. Hans and Gluck, you've lost me. This, this is all tongue-in-cheek, of course. Most players will have their favourite edition of the game and stick with it. But for those of us following the series, moving from one title to another, or teaching other players the latest variant, it is something of a hurdle. At the time of recording, Mists Over Carcassonne is the most recent release, and it might just be my favourite yet. But considering this is a series famed for its appeal to newcomers to the hobby, I'm convinced that the confusing rulebook will prevent many casual purchasers from ever actually playing the game. Carcassonne does have a junior edition for younger players, known by a variety of titles over many editions, sometimes Carcassonne Junior, sometimes My First Carcassonne, and sometimes The Kids of Carcassonne. The game is aimed at ages four and up, and it involves placing tiles to connect roads, but unlike regular Carcassonne, meeples aren't placed until a road is complete and players attempt to place all of their meeples before the other players to win the game. For a simplified experience somewhat closer to the core game, Overhill and Dale provides the most accessible package I've come across. In Overhill and Dale, cities become farmland, roads become hiking trails, and the original farms and monasteries are amalgamated into meadows and stables. You can place a meeple on a trail as usual, or instead extend an existing trail and hike one of your meeples, earning one point per tile that your hiker enters. Completing farmland scores points as usual, but you also gain tokens for each of the crops shown on the tiles. At the end of the game, you score points for sets of crop tokens, with scarecrows counting as wild crops. Finally, each player has two stables, which can be placed into meadows. And at the end of the game, you score one point per animal on each tile with a stable, and the eight tiles directly adjacent to it. 
Let's take a look at the core Carcassonne system and see if we can identify the reasons for its appeal. Now I rate games using my own ladder engagement system. A game is scored between 0 and 3 in 5 different categories, and each point scored climbs the game one rung up my engagement ladder. A total of 10 or above tops the ladder and indicates a real favourite with me. There's very little scope for thematic immersion in Carcassonne. It's essentially an abstract game, but the fantastic visual appeal of building a massive medieval landscape is appealing, so I'm awarding the game one point. For interaction, Carcassonne scores reasonably well. It's simple stuff, placing tiles in awkward places to limit opponents' chances of completing features, placing your meeples so that they can muscle in on opponents' cities, roads and farms, and of course collectively building a single map. For stress and tension, Carcassonne also scores two points. As the game approaches its conclusion, it becomes a race to complete unfinished features, and this is always reliant on a lucky tile draw. Feedback describes the ways in which a game responds to the player's input, and Carcassonne does well here. Features are completed throughout the game, and these award victory points in a variety of interesting ways, plus they return your meeples to you, opening up more opportunities for placement. The feedback in the game is frequent and consistent, so Carcassonne scores two. For meaningful choices, Carcassonne scores two. There's a lot of luck involved in the tile draw, but there are also plenty of intriguing choices to be made throughout the game regarding where to place your tile and when to utilise your meeples. Skilled players will develop strategies to contest high-scoring cities and farms, and the game can become quite in your face when you're playing at that level. The overall score of 9 indicates that Carcassonne is a very strong all-rounder without excelling in any one area. Between the original game, Hunters and Gatherers and Overhill and Dale, we've already covered a wide range of experiences utilising the core Carcassonne system, but I thought it might be interesting to consider expansions and variants which expand on each of these gameplay elements, enhancing thematic immersion, prioritising interaction, increasing stress and tension, providing greater feedback and highlighting strategic choices. If you're looking for a deeply immersive thematic experience, none of the Carcassonne variants are going to satisfy you. The most obvious attempt is 2015's Carcassonne Star Wars. In this version of the game, cities are replaced with asteroid belts, roads with trading routes, and monasteries with planets. And these all score exactly as in standard Carcassonne, with no equivalent for the original game's farmers. Each player has a Star Wars character, which corresponds to the colour of their meeples. When you score a feature with faction symbols on it, you score two additional points per symbol. When you place a planet, you can place a meeple on it as normal. But when you place a tile adjacent to a planet, you can also move a meeple onto the planet. And importantly, you can even do this if the planet is already occupied. And this will bring about a battle. Battles also occur when multiple meeples are brought together into a shared feature by joining up occupied trade routes or asteroid belts. In a battle, each player rolls one die per meeple of their colour in the contested feature. Each faction symbol in the feature which matches your character's faction adds an additional die. Players also have one large meeple each, which provides two dice if it's involved in a battle. The highest value rolled by each player is compared, and this number is taken from a single die rather than the sum total of all dice rolled, and the highest roller wins. The losing player withdraws their meeple and places it back in their reserve. In a tie, every player scores one point and then battles again. Carcassonne Star Wars is the least satisfying edition of the game that I've played. The map is ugly, an expanse of black space with weird lines everywhere representing trade routes. The theme falls apart when you start to ask yourself why you're able to place six Darth Vaders or six Yodas simultaneously on different planets around the galaxy. And the dice rolling is just incredibly jarring for anyone familiar with the usual Carcassonne vibe. For a slightly more thematic experience, I'd recommend Carcassonne Gold Rush. In this edition, mountains amass mining tokens for each gold icon on the tile. When a mountain is completed, the player who occupies it gains all the mountain tokens on the mountain. And the reverse of these tokens shows how many victory points they're worth. One, three, five or zero. Each player has a single tent token. You can place this on your turn or move it from one mountain to another, even placing it on a mountain which is already occupied. On a turn when you don't place a meeple or a tent, you can take the topmost mining token from the mountain where your tent is currently located. 
Railroads score the same as roads in the original game, but the score is doubled if there's one locomotive on the railroad. If there are two or more locomotives, however, the score is not doubled. Cities are the replacement for monasteries, and these are scored when all the railroad segments emerging from that city are completed, awarding three points per connected railroad. Finally, at game end, meeples placed in prairies score two points per TP camp and four points per herd of horses in the prairie. It's not a deeply immersive experience, but it does present a vague narrative of prospectors competing over gold mines in the American West. The base game of Carcassonne is already interactive, but there are various additions which offer up even greater interaction of one form or another. If you enjoy Take That mechanisms in games, you're going to want to check out expansion number three, The Princess and the Dragon. When a volcano tile is played, the dragon is positioned on top of it. From then on, every time a tile with a dragon icon is played, the dragon moves. And players take turns moving the dragon until it's moved across six tiles, removing meeples as it goes. Players may, however, protect one of their meeples from the dragon by moving the fairy token instead of placing a meeple on their turn. The player with the fairy scores one point at the start of each turn, and three additional points if the fairy is assigned to a meeple in a feature which is being scored. A city tile with a princess icon will remove one meeple from that city when the tile is placed. Now the most recent Carcassonne release, the spooky Mists Over Carcassonne, functions as a standalone game or an expansion. When using it as an expansion, the new tiles are combined with the original set and players compete to get the highest score. Many tiles feature mist banks. And if you place a mist tile so that it adjoins a matching mist edge, you can add a ghost to an opponent's meeple. Each of these ghosts is worth minus two points. But when a meeple has three ghosts on it, the meeple's removed and returned to its owner. Alternatively, you can place a mist tile so that the mist adjoins a field edge, breaking the usual matching edges rule. In this instance, you have to add a ghost to one of your own meeples. Now, each player has regular meeples, as in the original game, but also two guard meeples. Now, these are special pieces which cannot be affected by ghosts, so you're going to want to be saving these for the highest scoring features. You can gain additional guard meeples by completely surrounding cemeteries. Mists Over Carcassonne, as an expansion, has a totally different dynamic to any other version of Carcassonne I've played. Once your features grow, a massive city with lots of coats of arms, for example, you become a target for the other players and you'll soon start to amass ghosts. You don't want to get to three ghosts and lose your meeple, allowing opponents to jump into the city you've been cultivating. So the game becomes a frantic race to complete features before your opponents can stop you. It's delightfully tense. Of course, cutthroat gameplay like this won't be to everyone's taste. An interaction doesn't have to be destructive. Mists Over Carcassonne offers a totally different experience when played as a standalone game. This version of the game is the first cooperative Carcassonne variant. In the cooperative variant, players follow the usual Carcassonne sequence, draw a tile, then place it so that the roads, cities and fields match up. But when you add one of the foggy tiles, you also add ghosts as illustrated on the tile. And there are 15 of these in the supply, and if you ever run out, you lose the game. So you need to get them off the tiles as quickly as you can. And you do this by completing mist banks, or by foregoing points when you complete a city or a road. Players' points are combined, and the goal of the game is to achieve a specific score before the tiles run out. Once you've completed this level, several new tiles are introduced. Castles are completed by surrounding them on all sides, like monasteries from the original game. But these buildings score two points per adjacent foggy tile. Cemeteries are less desirable. Whenever at least one ghost is added to a foggy tile, an additional ghost is added to an open cemetery. The only way to shut the cemeteries down is to surround them on four sides. At that point, all ghosts are removed and one meeple is laid down on the cemetery to show that it's no longer open. Later levels introduce new features to make the game even more challenging. Now, if you don't enjoy Take That mechanisms, but you don't want to go full co-op, you might try playing with one of the less showy modules from one of the expansions. The castles from expansion eight, bridges, castles, and bazaars, add a nice element of positive interaction to the game, whereby you score points when your opponent completes features. 
Each player starts the game with a number of castle tiles. These can be placed with a meeple whenever you complete a small two-tile city, instead of placing and removing a meeple to score the usual four points. If you occupy a castle, the next time a neighbouring feature is completed, you'll receive the same number of points as the player who completed the feature. My next category is Tension and Stress. And Carcassonne Amazonas has a challenging race element at its core, as players attempt to position their boats further down the Amazon River than their opponents. The Amazon increases in length whenever an Amazon tile is drawn from the stack. And if you choose not to place a meeple on your turn, or if you add a boat icon to a tributary which you control, you advance your boat down the Amazon River. Whenever the Amazon is extended, the player whose boat is furthest down the river scores one point per Cayman and Piranha on the Amazon tile which has just been played. The boat in second position scores for the Piranhas only. Now this game has a very different feel to most Carcassonne variants, but the race element works nicely and it's hard to hang on to a lead while also maximising scoring in all the usual categories. Completing villages or tributaries in place of roads and placing camps on jungle spaces to score points for animals in that jungle at game end. One great way to incorporate stress and tension into a game is to build in some push-your-luck decisions. And one expansion which I have a particular soft spot for is number 9. The Hills and Sheep expansion introduces Shepherd tokens. On your turn, you can place your Shepherd on a field tile that you've just played. And when you do this, you draw a token from the bag. If it's a sheep, you place it next to your Shepherd. If it's a wolf, you place it back in the bag and remove your shepherd. When you place a tile which expands a field with your shepherd, you either grow your flock or score your sheep. To score sheep, you simply count them up and return them to the bag, taking your shepherd back too. To expand your flock, you draw a token from the bag and add it to the field if it's a sheep, or remove all your sheep and the shepherd if it's a wolf. If you enjoy titles like Quacks of Quedlinburg, Diamant, or Welcome to the Dungeon, then this expansion might work well for you. Tension is really cranked up in Carcassonne when the game puts time pressure on you to complete features, and often the clock is dictated by the actions of other players. For example, in Mists over Carcassonne, you need to complete cities quickly to rid yourself of ghosts. New World forces players to build away from the coast. Two surveyors commence the game on the starting board, and whenever a feature is scored, a surveyor advances one column into the landscape. Any meeples which fall behind the advancing surveyors are removed without scoring. This has a nice thematic explanation, with players exploring the New World after arriving on its beaches, but it also turns this into one of the most tense, cutthroat versions of Carcassonne yet, with players deliberately advancing the surveyors to eliminate opponents' meeples. When you're sitting on a high-scoring city, the clock is always ticking as those surveyors advance. Can you complete it in time? The basic Carcassonne scored reasonably well for feedback, but some variants are even more generous to the players. South Seas in particular is full of lovely wooden goods, which players amass when they complete features. Completed bridges award shells as shown on the tiles. Islands award bananas. Enclosed areas of sea award fish, which can also be gathered by adding a fishing boat to an area of sea where you already have a meeple present. At the end of your turn, you can deliver fish, shells and bananas to exactly one ship from the central display by discarding the exact tokens illustrated on the ship tile. At game end, players score points from their fulfilled ship tiles and any leftover goods tokens. In the Builders module from the second expansion from the base game, each player receives a Builder Meeple which can be added to any city or road you already occupy. Any time you add a tile to that city or road, you immediately get to take another turn. Taking a second turn is a very satisfying reward in Carcassonne, more so than amassing a few victory points or tokens, but that reward features in relatively few of the variant rule sets. In Hunters and Gatherers, if there are any gold nuggets in a forest when you complete it, you also draw a tile from the bonus stack and place it immediately. 
These tiles have special abilities. The fire chases away all tigers from a meadow. This is great because tigers cancel out point scoring deer in meadows at the end of the game. Mushrooms from special tiles add two points to the scoring of a completed forest. And the sacred shrine reserves a meadow for one player, regardless of the number of meeples contesting that meadow. I love the opportunity to gather special abilities in Hunters and Gatherers. Again, a feature sadly lacking from most Carcassonne rule sets. In Carcassonne the Castle, a score track runs around the outside of the play area, representing the castle walls. If, as a result of in-game scoring, your score marker ever lands exactly on a corner space, you take a wall tile and place it in your play area. These wall tiles give you special actions on future turns, allowing you an extra turn, doubling the scoring of a tower or house, allowing you to score incomplete features at game end, or increasing the size of your biggest house. And finally, there are many, many options available if you want to increase the number of strategic options in the game. For a start, you might want to adopt the official variant rule from the Carcassonne the Discovery rulebook. In Leo Colavini's early Carcassonne sequel, he proposed that players hold a hand of two tiles and select one of them to play on each turn, a rule adopted by many regular Carcassonne players over subsequent years. But if you're looking for a few more strategic options to add depth to your game, Carcassonne's first expansion, Inns and Cathedrals, is a great starting point. Adding one or more inns to a road doubles its score when completed, but if a road's incomplete at game end, it scores nothing. Similarly, adding a cathedral to a city increases the scoring from two to three points per tile or coat of arms within the city. But again, if the city's incomplete at game end, it scores nothing. Finally, each player receives a single large meeple, which can be placed using the normal rules. But this meeple counts double when competing over ownership of shared features. In the second expansion, Traders and Builders, some new city tiles depict resources wine, grain, or cloth. When you complete a city, your own or someone else's, you collect a matching token for each good in the city. At game end, whoever has the most goods in each category scores an additional 10 points. Each player also receives a pig meeple in their colour. You can add your pig to one of your farms to increase its value. A farm with a pig scores four points per completed city instead of the usual three. Over 23 years, Klaus Jürgen Raider really has explored and expanded on every aspect of the Carcassonne game. Very few games have been so thoroughly dissected, examined, reworked, and rejigged. Moving on to my product design checklist. Is this product innovative? Yes. When it came out in the year 2000, there was nothing else like it. And to this day, there are relatively few comparable tile laying games using a shared square grid instead of the ubiquitous polyomino. Cacao is a notable example. And several others, including Glenmore, Alhambra, and Isle of Sky, have individual grids in front of each player. Is there a need for this product? Well, absolutely. Two decades from release, Carcassonne remains one of the three titles most frequently recommended to newcomers to the hobby. There are many newer so-called gateway games, but Carcassonne manages to hold its own despite its age. Carcassonne, Ticket to Ride and Catan have introduced millions of gamers to the joys of modern tabletop games. Can the product grow with its user? I don't really need to answer this one, do I? Hans im Gluck have offered up a masterclass in how to support a product, building on their strengths at every step. Carcassonne is a powerful brand in the industry. It gave birth to the iconic Meeple, a symbol of modern gaming used widely across all aspects of the industry. So we can take it as read that Carcassonne is a brilliant product, an outstanding idea with phenomenal execution. But I wanted to explore some of the game design lessons we, as game makers, can take from the Carcassonne range. And with that in mind, I want to focus on conventions. And I'm not talking about Gen Con or Essen Spiel here. I'm talking about gameplay mechanisms employed within the base game of Carcassonne, which are pivotal to the overarching experience. So much so that when these conventions are broken, it becomes unintuitive or even jarring. I'm going to take several examples from the standalone Carcassonne Safari. So let's take a look at how that one plays. See if you can spot any broken conventions. 
Carcassonne Safari features trails in place of roads, bush in place of cities, and baobab trees in place of monasteries. Completed trails score an escalating number of points for the number of different animals on the trail. Bush scores in a similar manner to cities from the original game, plus points for different animals, as with trails, and one point per bird above the bush. A ranger token sits on the table adjacent to a tile. Placing a tile on the empty space occupied by the ranger scores you three points, and then you move the ranger to a new spot. Placing a meeple on the baobab tree awards you two animal tokens. Fully surrounding the tree with tiles gives you two further tokens and returns your meeple. Animal tokens can be used to supplement sets of animals from trails or bush, maximising the points received. Alternatively, on your turn, you can place an animal token on the corner of any savannah tile and place a meeple onto it. This creates a watering hole and scores you three points. Adding a second different animal to an existing watering hole scores four points. A third animal scores five points, and a fourth scores six. The owner of a completed watering hole scores an additional three points. Now, the first broken convention relates to the placement of wooden tokens. In Carcassonne, you place wooden tokens onto cardboard tiles. You don't fling them on with catapults, you place them on. Wood on cardboard. In Safari, you sometimes place a cardboard tile onto a wooden token, the ranger, which sits directly on the tabletop outside of the map. Now this is strategically interesting. Placing on the ranger maximises your scoring, but reduces your placement options. But aesthetically, it's jarring to have a wooden component existing outside of the landscape that we're collectively building. What is the shadow world that exists in your mind when playing a game of Carcassonne? Maybe it's never occurred to you. But deep in my subconscious, I'm pretty convinced the meeple world of Carcassonne does not exist outside the constraints of that expanding map. A jeep on a tabletop just feels wrong. I feel a similar repulsion to the face-down tiles used as wild terrain in some of the later difficulty levels of the cooperative Mists over Carcassonne variant. I'm all for clever use of tiles, and I welcome the stacking of tiles in the ninth expansion to create hills, but I am not happy with face-down tiles ruining the glorious vista of my growing French landscape. Not happy at all. The second convention broken by Safari also relates to the placement of tokens. In Carcassonne, tokens are always placed on the tile you've just played. In Safari, on your turn, you can place watering holes anywhere, so long as there's a savanna space anywhere at all. I can't even. These might seem like petty grievances, but for a long-time Carcassonne player, they're tricky rules to remember. They're easy to mess up, and they just feel out of place. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm quite happy with altered rule sets. Why else would I own so many Carcassonne variants? I, I can even find some enjoyment from the Princess and Dragon's magic portal tiles, which when played allow you to place a meeple on any other tile, so long as it's not part of a feature which is already occupied or completed. This feels fine, because the portal tiles come up infrequently, and they are framed as a special event, a fun little boost for the player who finds the portal. Altered rule sets need to fall within the circle of expectation for the subject matter, a term coined by British storytelling and improv guru Keith Johnston. For example, I have zero complaints about the scoring of Safari's trails and bush tiles based on sets of animals. That falls in line with the coats of arms in the cities from the original game, or the bonus points gathered from placement of inns and cathedrals, or pigs in the early expansions. Rolling dice to resolve space battles between rebels and the Empire? Not so much. There are certain things that Carcassonne is, and there are certain things it will never be. In the Bridges, Castles and Bazaars expansion, each player starts the game with a number of bridge pieces. You can use these at any time to essentially add a road to a tile, so long as both ends of the bridge sit on fields. These pieces count as roads for all other purposes. Now it's a stretch, but I can accept it. Wooden tokens placed onto cardboard tiles is within the circle of expectation. If you place a bazaar tile, you host an auction. Reveal a number of tiles equal to the number of players, and the player on your left selects one tile and bids a number of victory points for it. 
In clockwise order, each player bids or passes. The player who selected the tile must then either buy the tile from the highest bidder, paying them in victory points, or sell the tile to the highest bidder, taking victory points from them. The next player selects a tile and the process is repeated until all tiles have been taken. The tiles are then placed in turn order as per the usual rules of the game. No, 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 that is not how Carcassonne works at all. It's a fine mechanism for a Knizia auction game, but it totally breaks the flow and it's the reason that Expansion 8 is widely regarded as one of the weakest. Carcassonne convention number one. Draw a tile, place a tile. Another broken convention crops up in a number of variants. Artificial constraints on the playing space. In Carcassonne, we can expand in all directions. The only limit is the size of our imaginations and our tables. Amazonas features an expanding central river and players are not allowed to place tiles beyond the current end of the river. This feels more of an artificial constraint than New World, where players are forced to build away from the coast, having presumably landed in their ships and started to explore. In Amazonas, there's no thematic justification. The rule is clearly there to prevent players placing tiles which block the future direction of the river. It's clunky. In Carcassonne the City, players add city walls around the edge of the player tiles whenever a feature is scored, enclosing the growing map and limiting options for future tile placement. Additionally, players can position meeples as guards onto the city walls, scoring points at the end of the game for the buildings on tiles in the same row. The two-player Carcassonne the Castle is played within predetermined walls. And that's quite a satisfying constraint. You know your limits, but you still have a wide open space to work with. It's a similar concept to that seen in the recent series of regional maps with predetermined grids. The limited space is not, however, the only convention broken in the castle and the city. Carcassonne 101. Terrain types have to match. Roads meet roads. Cities join cities. Fields connect to fields. If you're going to break this convention, you'd better tread carefully. In the city and the castle, paths must connect to each other or to the boundary walls, but there's no obligation to match other terrain types. So in the castle, you can join towers to houses, houses to courtyards, courtyards with towers. And this makes for a far less attractive map but it drives the central conceit of the game. The players are competing to build the largest keep within the castle walls. Houses score one point per tile when completed, but the player with the largest joined collection of houses at game end scores points equal to the number of spaces in the largest empty area within the castle walls. It's an ingenious twist, which makes the two-player duel tense and enjoyable. Perhaps I shouldn't be surprised. This particular version of Carcassonne was designed by the master of tricksy little scoring systems, Reiner Knizia. The other variant, where terrain types don't have to match, is in Mists over Carcassonne. Now, in both the cooperative and the competitive versions of the game, players are allowed to match mist banks with fields, but never with roads or cities. It doesn't look great, of course, because it results in mist banks terminating with a solid straight line, but the game is gorgeous enough to make up for any shortcomings, and the mechanism is handled brilliantly, primarily because, while it's possible to match mist with field, it's rarely a strong move to do so. In the cooperative game, you need to complete mist banks to rid the map of ghosts, and mist banks adjoining fields can never be completed, so there are a significant setback to achieving your end game objective. In the competitive game, connecting a mist tile to another mist tile inflicts ghosts on your opponents, but connecting mist to field puts ghosts onto your own meeples, and ghosts are always undesirable. Another Carcassonne convention. Players score points when features are completed. Leo Colavini broke this convention in his 2005 reimagining. In Carcassonne The Discovery, on your turn, you can either place a meeple or remove a meeple. Removing a meeple will score a feature immediately, irrespective of whether it's completed or not. Now, it's beneficial to wait until the feature is complete. You get more points that way, but you have a reduced pool of meeples in this version, so you do want to bring them home more frequently. 
Game design is largely the business of identifying conventions in existing games and finding ways to break or stretch them. But when stepping outside of the circle of expectation, it's wise to be cognizant of the impact on accessibility, thematic immersion and the general flow of your game. How far is too far? Let's consider the most common house rule of all. Drawing a tile at the end of your turn instead of at the start. This altered rule undeniably makes the game run more smoothly. You can think about your options while the other players take their moves, so you're ready to play the minute your turn comes around. It's so obvious that it beggars belief that Klaus Jürgen Raider has never adopted it as an official rule in any of the later editions of the game. So perhaps we need to revisit that. What do we lose by drawing a tile at the end of the turn? How does it change the player's experience? Now the rulebook to my 2000 edition of the game says, first a player must draw a land tile. He looks at it, shows it to his fellow players so that they can advise him on the best placement of the tile and places it on the table. Near identical wording is used in New World, Hunters and Gatherers, The Discovery and The Castle, gendered language and all. Each of these editions imagines players working together, advising each other on placement of tiles. Raider doesn't want players focused on their own strategies, ignoring the actions of other players. His vision for the game seems almost semi-cooperative, with all players involved in their opponent's turns. Drawing at the end of your turn distracts from that sending you into your own head for a significant portion of the game, rather than simply being present. I must admit, when I play, we draw at the end of the turn, but I'd be interested to hear which way you prefer to play. Let me know in the comments. Klaus Jürgen Raider's achievement in creating a world of related games and maintaining relevance over many years can't be overstated. That's the reason Carcassonne joins King Domino, Everdell, Sushi Go and Viticulture, becoming my fifth entry in my Game Design Hall of Fame. Klaus Jürgen Raider has created hundreds of interchangeable modules to create an incredible number of possible ways to play Carcassonne. In doing so, he's essentially monopolised the market for tile placement on a shared grid. There are other examples out there, abstract games like Quirkle, games played on a board like Tigris and Euphrates, but there are a few that invite players to create and inhabit an open landscape on the tabletop. So here's my design challenge for you. After learning about the huge number of different mechanisms utilised by Klaus Jürgen Raider, what's the one mechanism he's missed? Can you imagine a tile laying game on a shared grid which could stand alongside Carcassonne but carve out its own identity? Perhaps there are some new avenues to explore in the drawing or drafting of tiles. Perhaps your new version has a unique mechanism for placing tokens on the map. Perhaps you have a clever new scoring system. Whatever it is, I'd love to hear about it. And if you enjoyed this video, you'll probably also like my deep dives into the worlds of Everdell or King Domino. Follow the links.